today. Well, when it does come to the subject of moms, we know that mothers have it tough, correct? We know that mothers have it tough. Well, the room was actually pretty quiet, so I don't know whether mothers didn't want to brag or, uh, or you guys don't really understand get it, but we know that moms and all that they have to do, they have to get, it's a, it's a tough job. This is not a selfless job in any sense of the world. Uh, it is not a job for the weak. There is a stamina that has to happen when one becomes a mom. But you know who else has a tough job, a really tough job? Pastors. <laughs> Especially when it comes to Mother's Day. When you think about it, what the subject of Mother's Day, the freshness, the fact that people have come for the first time, maybe sons have come for their moms or moms have come for their kids in one way or the other. And so they're here in the house and it's like Mother's Day. And what do you actually really do when it comes to Mother's Day? And here's the best part. My own mom, who has been a mom herself for 60 years, said to me on Wednesday on the phone, so she said, so what are you going to do this weekend? Are you going to stay in the text where you were, or are you going to give one of those flowery messages that no one really listens to or remembers? <laughs> so like, well, thanks, mom, you know. And, uh, but see, there is just that whole subject. When it comes to Mother's Day, have we heard it all? Have we been in this context? And so I got to tell you, sometimes those are the hardest subjects to get to. I'll tell you when it's really, really hard as a pastor when it comes to Mother's Day is when where you left off the week before picks up on Mother's Day with this phrase, but when you see the abomination of desolation. <laughs> yes. So grab your Bibles, if you would, and let's go to Mark chapter 13, verse 14, and let me explain where God is taking us here this weekend. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and we will get one to you. But yes, on Mother's Day weekend, we are in Mark chapter 13. Find me at verse 14. How are you there? I see a hand way over there in the far right back corner, back there. Okay, great. So Mark chapter 13, verse 14. It says this, but when you see the abomination of desolation, and if you have like a new King James, it will say, spoken of by the Daniel, by, excuse me, by Daniel the prophet, standing where it should be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let the one who was on the housetop not go down or enter in to get anything out of his house and let him who was in the field not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days. But pray that it may not happen in the winter for those days will be a time of tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of all creation which God created until now and never shall and unless the Lord shortened those days no life would have been saved but for the sake of the elect whom he chose he shortened the days so shall we close in prayer Now, obviously, this is the text where we left off last week, and this is where we step right into. And so the whole question was, Lord, what do you have for your church this weekend? What do you have for the moms who are doing this incredibly difficult and selfless task? And what do you have for us as the body of Christ? And as I prayed real hard about what God had for us this weekend, he gave me an answer. And when that answer came, it was awesome. And at least it was to me. An hour later, you'll decide whether it is to you. But I loved it. I loved what God shared with me. And so what we're first going to look at is this. When it comes to looking at scripture, and especially scriptures regarding the last days, the end times, there's many ways of looking at scripture. And that is very much uh, illustrated by paintbrushes. There is the very broad brush stroke that you have here. Then you have kind of a, a more, a little bit medium-sized one. Then you start getting into a little bit smaller, maybe a little bit of cutting. Then you get yourself down here into this, this one inch. And so there's this type of looking at things are going on in Scripture. And then you kind of go through what Wax is normally giving to you in Scripture of why it takes, you know, a year and two to get through the book of Mark. And then, then there's the real study that I love. 
of really finding out what's in there and why that's in there. And so what we're going to do today is the fact that the Lord of heaven put all of this together on a day such as this, a time such as this, I believe he is going to show us through a very broad brushstroke. I'm going to be using this brush today as we look at these elements of what it really means in the context of end times teaching. Why? Because I believe it's going to reveal for all of us here a very powerful parental point. So, where we are in the Gospels, we've been reading through, we are now in Jesus' teaching, as I mentioned, of the days that are coming to head, known as the last days, or end times, end of the world, or some think it was just end of civilization teaching. But here's something you need to pick up on that maybe you haven't in the last couple of weeks. This mindset, this teaching on end times, last days, as I said, so often people think, Christians today are fixated on it and they have an obsession with it. You have to understand that this topic of the world, quote, coming to an end is not new to modernity. This whole subject, the study of whether there is an end of the world has gone on through all civilizations. Every civilization we know of and religion even then had some kind of apocalyptic point of view, teaching and perspective. And so many in the philosophy department began to wonder why. Why do all these religions, Mayas, Incas, all these, why do they have some kind of apocalyptic teaching, some kind of mindset of the world coming to an end, a final judgment? Well, would that not make sense? That as they look at every civilization from the earliest of rec recorded time till now, that they have this mindset of a global judgment, would that not make sense? If we all came from the same boat? Hmm. See, I had professors who would say, oh, you know, you're Christians, you're talking about this, and you, you think it's this, and so on and so forth. Well, the Mayans had this, and this, and they had this, and I'd go, yeah, but wouldn't that make sense if we all got off the same boat? We'd have the same history. We'd have the same story. And then they're all like, uh, 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 uh. Because you see, if civilization, which I truly believe 100%, came out of Noah's Ark, then as the families of the earth spread out, they would understand that there was, in fact, a judgment that was placed by a holy God and a redemption that was given a place, a new life that was set for the family to come out. You see, even us today, as we look at life, we all understand that we understand atrophy, okay? We understand entropy. We understand that that's the second law of thermodynamics, that there is this whole point, and you look at the description of it here. It says the degradation of matter and energy in the universe to an ultimate state of inerrant Uniformity. Entropy is the general trend of the universe towards death and disorder. So we understand as we look in the mirror that things just get worse. Come on, that was a joke. Okay, they don't get better. They gotta, you're kind of like going, yeah, 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 not at puberty and everything else, and all of a sudden it goes, boo, and now it starts going like this. Okay. And so we begin to recognize that things are getting older, our own cars, everything. So we understand entropy, but we also understand obsolescence. My father-in-law is always talking about built-in obsolescence. It seems like everything we buy, every tool that I have, falls apart so quickly. And so, I wanted to show you something that I thought was pretty funny. And that is, you know, the old sense in honor of moms on Mother's Day, whenever you said, what does this word mean, obsolescence, what would your mom say? Look it up. And this is the classic. Look it up. The definition of obsolescence, the act of becoming the condition of being obsolete. Thank you. So then you got to go to the next one. So what is something that's obsolete? It's no longer in use or no longer useful. Sometimes we start thinking that about life and in itself. Of a kind or a style no longer current. An obsolete technology. And so we look in our own natural realm and we understand that things have an end. We know that there's death. We know that things begin to rust and decay and all of these things. And so apparently this subject was quite the topic of the day in Jesus' time as well as after Jesus with the Apostle Paul of the world coming to some form of an event. Now, we looked last week at the events that Jesus began to state and he said, when these things happen on earth, they are going to be merely, what does he call them? birth pangs birth pangs and what we began to do is as we looked at the basically the world with the newspaper in our hand here and what the bible was saying there we began to understand that all what the bible was talking about these birth pangs which are to what 
show us when the time, hear me clearly on this, when the time for Christians to be on the earth would come to an end. We're not talking about the end of all life and all civilization. He is speaking about the time for Christians on earth to come to an end. At this point, you know it as this term, the rapture, when God will pull out his elect from them. He's beginning to describe what these events would look like. And as we looked at birth pangs, what happens as it gets closer to birth, they increase in intensity and in regularity. And we begin to realize maybe, just maybe, Earth is dilated at nine centimeters. <laughs> we might be ready to go. So those of you who love to study the end times and what's being taught, I just want to let you know that although this week I'm going to be doing a pretty broad brushstroke, next week we'll get back to business. And we'll take a little bit deeper look at what some of these things are and what they mean. But here is how I'm going to get back to Mother's Day. Take your Bibles with me now and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Find me at verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2. As we look at Jesus' warning and saying, look, this is what the world is going to look like. Be ready so you can understand the signs of the times, the times of the signs. When Jesus is telling his people to be prepared and prepared for a reason, I want you to see now a correlating, correlating scripture. All right, you guys there? 2 Timothy 1, verse 2. It says, To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. Verse five, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. Now, here in this letter that he is writing to this young pastor, so senior pastor Paul is writing to junior pastor, okay, so it's wax, you're writing to Myola, as Myola is now in his own church, in his own place, and so he's writing him to encourage him, and so he's, hey, Timothy, so he says, my son in the faith, he's expressing something. What is he expressing? That he had the privilege in that first missionary journey to lead Timothy to the Lord, but he knows something. As he is commending Timothy for how mature he is in the Lord. In fact, we even see this in other scriptures. It says this in Acts 16 verse 2. It speaks of him and it says that he was well spoken of by the brethren who were there at Lista. What he is saying is, Timothy, your faith is mature. But he gives full credit to the foundation that was laid. He gives full credit that he received a foundation as a child. From whom? From his mother and from his grandmother. So he was raised in this godly home that raised this foundation so that when it came time for the gospel to be heard, he had this foundation to receive it and he had enough maturity in it that he was able to grow like this rich soil that the seed now just blossomed. Are you following with me? What I want to encourage right now, whether with us online or whether you're with us here today, is this. I've never even really thought of it this way. But as we look at our growing, increasing world of division, what an encouragement this is for any of you parents this weekend who are living in, you know, we hear a lot about single parents, but perhaps you're married, but you're living in a single Christian parent home. And that was Timothy. We all know that his father was a Greek. So much so that it was discussed that he had to be circumcised when they went to do the ministry into Jerusalem, so on and so forth. So even though his father was a Greek, the fact that there was a foundation of a godly mom and a godly grandmother around Timothy, the foundation was laid for him to become a believer. What does that mean? Well, it seems then that Timothy must have had the meanest mother in the world. <laughs> what do I mean by that? We had the meanest mother in the world, a writer wrote. While other kids ate candy for breakfast, we had to have cereal, eggs, and toast. 
While others had Pepsi and a Twinkie for lunch, we had to eat sandwiches. And you can guess our mother fixed us dinner that was different than all the other kids had too. Mother insisted on knowing that where we were all the times. You'd think we were convicts in a prison. She had to know who our friends were and what we were doing with them. She insisted that if we would be gone for an hour, we would be gone for an hour or less. We were ashamed to admit it, but she had the nerve to break the child labor laws by making us work. We had to wash the dishes, make the beds, learn to cook, vacuum the floor, do laundry, and all sorts of cruel jobs. I think she would lie awake at night thinking of more things to do for us to do. She always insisted on telling us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. By the time we were teenagers, she could read our minds. <laughs> then life was really tough. Mother wouldn't let our friends just honk the horn when they drove up. They had to come to the door so she could meet them. Well, everyone else could date when they were 12 or 13. We had to wait until we were 16. Because of our mother, we missed out on lots of things other kids experienced. None of us have ever been caught shoplifting, vandalizing others' property, or even arrested for any crime. It was all her fault. We never got drunk, took off smoking, stayed out all night, over a million other things other kids did. Sundays were reserved for church, and we never missed once. We knew better than to ask to spend night with a friend on Saturdays. Now that we have left home, we are all God-fearing, educated, honest adults. We are doing our best to be mean parents just like mom was. <laughs> I think that's wrong with the world today. It just doesn't have enough mean moms anymore. Hmm. Yes, applaud all the mean moms, yes. But there was something inside Timothy within a confine that he knew that he was loved. He knew that there was boundaries and there was parameters around him. Now, most of you who've been around uh, long enough, you've heard my illustration regarding a sponge and how the Christian life is very similar to a sponge. And that is that when you first get it, it's made to do something and it's just sitting there and it's kind of in, in existence. It's kind of, it's not hard, it's not soft. And as soon as you put that sponge into the water, it begins to soak up and it starts to all of a sudden become excited. It starts doing what it was made to do and you wipe it across and it's just soaking up all the water but what do you have to do pretty soon you have to wring it out because if not then it starts just pushing water around correct and so we've spoken about that and the fact in the Christian life because if you just leave a sponge in the water it just starts falling apart think about when Christians are just all around in churchy things they just start falling apart and churches start dividing and all these things because they've never been wrung out or if they get completely taken out of the water, if you ever take a sponge out of the water and let it dry up, what happens? It gets all crusty. It's all crusty. It's like, ugh. It's really hard and it's jaggedy. You see someone who's left the fellowship, who's left the faith, stopped reading their Bible and they just become all, all crusty and all the things in life. And so we begin to realize that what God has wired us to do is to soak up the living water, but the only purpose is that we are to soak up is to be also wrung out. And we've spoken about that the home life is one of the best places to be wrung out. And so, people like John Lennox, who is probably one of the finest living minds on the planet, the one who has single-handedly put Dawkins and Hitchens in their place, has shut them down over and over and over. You can look up any YouTube uh, debate that they had with them. This incredible, brilliant mind. And he says, and I quote, I'm a Christian because I was encouraged to think. And this is what he, John Lennox, says about his childhood. My parents' faith was authentically lived out at home. So as when I went to college, this is Cambridge and Oxford that he goes to, that he has all these multiple degrees and becomes professors there. So as I went to college, I had a foundation to stand on. Now let me say that again. My parents' faith was authentically lived out so that when I went to college, where all of those who would come and lambast the Christian faith, he said, I had a foundation to stand on. Now, Dr. David Jeremiah was saying something last week in a devotional that I was reading that was very similar to the very same thing that I've talked about as being sponges. Let me quote him. It says this, mothers, grandmothers, parents, and all the rest of us should soak up scripture like sponges because God wants even the slightest pressure upon us to yield an outpouring of his word on others. Isn't that good? When the world starts taking a squeeze, what's going to come out? It says these two women... Okay, talking about Timothy's grandma and mom, were saturated with scripture and Timothy lived in the overflow. Get that word picture there, moms. 
We need to saturate ourselves with God's word so the blessing will overflow on our children and all who come after us. Let's be human sponges of the water of God's word. And the quote was, Bible saturation is very different from the thin dribble of Bible that satisfies most of us. Have we just had contact with or have we been saturated with his word, his will, and his way? And so now we see Paul writing to this young pastor who got it so quickly as soon as the gospel came that now he's being a pastor of a church. Now let's move to chapter 3. So he starts off there in chapter one saying, hey, brother, here's the thing. I recognize it was your mom and your grandma and you're doing so solid. And now we get to chapter three. And I want you to follow along with me now as we see this incredible event. So now as he continues to teach, notice it says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Okay, we'll stop right there. So he's starting to write to him about how it will look like in the last days. Does this sound familiar at all? I love the fact that it says men will be lovers of self. I think we can take this across the board. We have an infatuation with people loving self today, um, as we can see here. And if you actually saw this, this is a hysterical, it was during a, the, the Major League Baseball game, and they kept watching the same group of about six or seven girls into the entire game. They were on their phone taking pictures of themselves or, or looking down at the phone the entire game. So that they, they just couldn't hear, it's the World Series, hello. You see, people, lovers of self. So now, let's go on down, what he goes on to say. Verse five, holding to a form of godlessness, although they have, excuse me, godliness, although they have denied its power and avoid such people as these. Those who talk a good God, but they live a different way. He's just careful of your environment. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning, check this out, and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. You know what he just described? In these last days, there will be people who are looking for information, but they have no illumination. Always learning, but never getting the the connection. You know, these people that you meet with degree after degree after degree, and they're as lost as anyone in the dark without a flashlight. Then he goes on to say this. Verse 8. And just as Janus and Jambres opposed uh, Moses, those were the magicians that came with Moses when he was standing in front of Pharaoh, these men of depraved mind rejected as regards to the faith. Verse 9. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, as that those who came to be. But you, notice now Timothy, but you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, suffering, such as happened to me as in Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra. By the way, that's where he got saved, Lystra. And what persecutions I endured out of all of them, the Lord did what? Delivered me. Okay, I just wait for a second. So he said, hey, so there's people right now because Jesus rose from the dead. What was happening? Are the last days coming? Has it happened already? All these things that were going on that Paul was trying to inform the church. He starts off by saying, Timothy, you are a mature young man. And it's because Jesus got into your heart, but you had this foundation that your parents laid. And then he starts saying, but this is what it's going to look like last days. This is what people are going to be like. But then he begins to describe him, Timothy himself, and he talks about him, but you followed the teachings, meaning there was a maturity to be able to discern right from wrong, to not follow the crowd or what was popular, but what was going on. And he said, why? Well, you saw even how I was persecuted, but the Lord brought me through those persecutions. Stick with me now. Verse 12, and indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be what? Okay, is is that highlighted in your Bible? Okay, it it should be. 
Again, one of those verses that I normally find on pillows in Christian bookstores. <laughs> but it just said that we should never be asking the question, why is this happening to me? Whether it was the lawsuits that we had as a church coming against us from the Citizens for Separation Church and State or whatever it may be, it says right here. And indeed, all, big circle all, the Greek word all means all. Okay, pause means all. Who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I want to stop right here because I want to get real with you. And you'll see why when I get to the end of this message. But if you are not in any sense of the word having any kind of difficulty in this life because you have believed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and asked him to be just that, your Lord and Savior, and you are born again. If you are not having any type of persecution, of difficulty of any kind, then I believe the cards are on the table. Are you born again? There is no secondary Christianity. Billy Graham always said, God has no grandchildren. You're either a child of God or not. And if you're a child of God, you will look different in this world. We've been spending so much time trying to blend. And God does not ask us to be obnoxious, but he does ask us to be illumined. To let our light so shine that others would see and give glory to our Father that is in heaven. Now you think with me as he says these things, he says, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Verse 13, but evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now verse 14, you, Timothy, however, continue in all the things you have learned and become convinced of it, knowing from whom you have learned them. Who is this? Verse 15, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you what the wisdom that leads to what salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus whoa as the world's getting crazy all around you Timothy you've known God's word will and way and you've chosen to live that why because you were exposed to the scriptures and then you understood them as your mind matured and you gave your life to the Lord because you've seen his promises lived out in my life and in your life and now as you're going to stand in the pulpit and proclaim and pre preach which he did he was persecuted and put to death eventually understand this folks he is saying look this is because you have this foundation you have this impact in the world where you're at. Here's the why I'm making all this big point. Because everybody knows the next following verses, but they don't usually know the context that it was in. The very next verse, after he says, out of childhood, you were able to get wisdom because of Christ Jesus. Verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for what? Training in righteousness. Why? Verse 17, that the man, and again, the Greek word there is person of God, may be adequate, equipped for what? Every good work. Every good work. Every good work. So he's beginning to say, hey, listen, Timothy, all scripture is inspired. And so as you enter anything in life, the word of God is going to give you the wisdom to deal with every matter in every place in every subject. Are you seeing that with me, church? Amen? Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. Remember last week when we talked about doom and gloom? When we look at the end times and the last days, people are like, oh, why are you guys all about doom and gloom? We're not. We're about gloom and zoom. I know that as the world gets more and more, and exactly as the Bible said, well, it said it would be this way, and it is, and it said it would be this way, and it would, and all these things that were way beyond someone could know the time space continuum on these factors. We'll talk about that more next week, next time. But here's the thing. As he's beginning to lay all these things out and saying, look, the more and more you see these events happening, because you know the scripture, you are not going to find yourself overwhelmed, fearful, worried of the environment, the things going on in the world. You're going to be finding yourself more and more on fire, more and more ready, because you know that God is right on schedule and that you are right around the corner. And though the earth is doing that car last week, you see home when you're doing what? 
And you find this absolute mind change which is completely different in the world. The point is, is that when I have a walk with Jesus Christ, when I know what his word promises for me and you and our future, the byproduct is not fear, it's joy. Joy. This is one of my favorite little plays on words. No Jesus, no fear. No Jesus, no fear. But it's been amazing to me again for all of our world, all of our Christians who have found themselves struggling so much in the events of these days. I believe God brought this whole pandemic, this whole element within it. I believe one of the things that he is using within this is to allow us to be refined. We got so comfy. We got so cozy. We got so on just automatic mode. Hey, I I prayed the prayer, eighth grade. I got baptized. I'm good. I'm going. I'm in. And yet, Nothing has really seemed to have any challenge in your life. And all of a sudden, fear is something that can easily rise up within you. Now, listen, we understand when Polycarp and the rest of the martyrs were thrown inside the Colosseum. And as they were in this position right here, as we understand that as you see Christians all around being burned alive on the outside, and the others were in the center being eaten up by lions. This is documented fact here, folks. This is not just some artistic rendition. These are the things that the Romans documented about the death of Polycarp and his disciples. The point of the matter is, I don't believe in any sense of the word. I have no idea in my mind that these people had an emotional disconnect. Meaning, at any point, at any time, when someone's about to put fire at your feet and a lion coming out right in front of you, the human response is going to be, ah, fear. Then what does it mean when you're saying here, Paul is saying to Timothy, I'm saying here, no Jesus, no fear. No Jesus, no fear. It's the fact, the fact that we have a place to take our fear. And that's what brings the peace. Amen? Amen. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's being able to know where to take that fear and be in that very fear. Find yourself this resolve. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is the one that comes in and fills. You see, we have not because we ask not. And so what he's saying is that the mature child of God does not have fear because the moment that they find this natural response to any scary situation, they have the immediate place to cry out, Abba. As any parent here, any mom here, when their child is frightened and they go, Mommy. And all they really need to do is to see you or hear you and something changes within their whole Disp- um, you know what I'm trying to say? Disposition, not disposition. What's the word I'm looking for? However they are. <laughs> I got to go pigeon already. <laughs> Am I making any sense? Yes. Okay, see, here's the thing. God's word, God's promises for our future, folks, is to draw us to faith and assurance So that when anything, they say, hey, the world is going to happen, this, this is going to happen, all the stores are going to close, whatever it may be, God's promise for you and I draws us from any reaction to a proactive understanding of faith and assurance. Look overhead. Hebrews chapter 10, 19. Since therefore we have, what? Confidence. To enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. So it's not about what I've done, it's what he's doing by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us. Wow. He's got the plan. It was his design, and he even made it possible through the veil. That is his flesh. Verse 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, says this, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full, what does it say? Assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast to the confession of our what? Our hope without wavering. And don't miss the very clear connection. Let's hold fast to our hope. Now, eyes this way for a second, please. Many have found yourself struggling in these circumstances or other circumstances, they come in and say, well, that lump is actually more than a lump. Stage three, stage four, whatever it is, it's cancer, lymphoma, whatever the thing is that they want to begin to say. And all of a sudden you you get this news that shows again the mortality of who we are. And all of a sudden we begin to lose hope. We find ourselves hopeless 
this total epidemic of Christians around the world finding themselves in suicide positions and actually taking their lives. Only a hopeless individual can do so. The problem is, and may I be so bold to say, is because their hope was in hope. Their faith was in faith. But it says here, hope without waving. So we're going to hold fast to what? The confession of our hope without wavering. What? For, what does it say? It doesn't say it. Amen, church? For who's faithful? Jesus is. I said people have walked away from Christianity because they put their whole faith and hope into a church, into a pastor. And when he had moral failure, and he, oh, you see, they're all fakes. The whole thing is phony. And they just walk away and just give up. Why? Because their faith was in the wrong place. It says here. That no matter what the news is in the next five minutes, no matter what it is, we can hold fast to hope. Why? Because hope is holding fast to us. And his name is Jesus. Mm, 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 mm. Hebrews 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of of things not seen. Remember I shared with you a while ago that so often the antagonist of Christianity will say, hey, I don't believe in God or Christians because of the way they live. And I said, okay, well, if you can't believe in Jesus because of the way we live, come with me into the hospitals and let's watch how we die. Total game changer. Been there a gazillion times. And you see, I love singing with those dear ones that I know are going to heaven. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And they're just like, yes. My dear friend, Alex McGangus, who is the one who has handed over the Waikiki Beach chaplaincy to us. He's ready. He's got total peace, total joy. And when the hour will come, You see, my point here is this. Listen, dear ones, as we see our society becoming more and more uncertain, don't we want to be raising up a generation of people who are full of faith, assurance, conviction, and confidence? Yes? Those are the very words that the Bible just said are the very byproducts of God's word, will, and way. Those are the very promises in those scriptures. I want to be raising up a generation all around me of people full of faith, assurance, conviction, and confidence. And let me tell you, I can testify. I can testify. I was nurtured in the ways of God. I grew up listening to Bible stories on those little felt boards. Bible stories in the little books and the little comics that were given to me as a, tiny, as a small little child. It's my birth name, David. Yes, it's not actually Waxer, it's David. <laughs> my mom's like, I gave you this biblical name like David, and you go by Waxer. <laughs> but if David, who said, What? This Philistine? The entire Israelite army saw this monster, this giant, and he was too big, so they got frightened. David, he didn't see a monster that was too big to be frightened. He saw a monster that was too big to miss. (laughs) Beige. What? Daniel. Trapped. And instead of trying to argue, no, no, they said this king, they set this up, and you don't have to put me in that lion's thing. He says, well, if God's in this, God is in this. He went home, it says he opened his gates, as was his custom. He didn't try to hide his Christianity when all of a sudden Christianity became illegal. That's exactly what happened. Read the chapter. He did just as he did. He opened up his doors and his windows and he prayed towards Jerusalem. They arrest him. They throw him inside. And he knew it was a win-win. If he was eaten, he was with father. If he was not, he had another powerful story to share with the King Darius. Wow. Moses. Good grief. Stand in front of Pharaoh. And all those miracles that happened. You know, sometimes we're so afraid to pray and ask for something. And at the end, we're like, okay, well, your will be done. How'd you like to stand in front of the most powerful man in the world and say, yeah, tomorrow, your entire country is going to be covered with frogs. (laughs) But he knew God was speaking. And Paul, Peter, the things that these men did, Jonathan, 
hey, let's go see if God wants to wipe out an entire army, just the two of us. Let's go. <laughs> These are the stories that I grew up listening to, being told to with fun and creativity, acting out as a family in our living room. And not just these stories. I had many after biblical heroes that were lying, that were that just re revealed to me what it means to live for Jesus, like Jim Elliot, who said he is no fool to give up what he can't keep. I can't keep my life one day. I'm not in charge. I'm not in control. To give up what he can't keep, to gain what he can't lose. So he and Nate Saint and the rest of them, they went and flew in. As you know the story, they were martyred for their faith. But then thousands came as the news went out to replace them. And then, of course, Dr. Livingston, you presume. And if you don't know the story of Dr. Livingston, an amazing God-fearing man who went into the jungles of Africa and he led them to this very day. Christianity has a presence because of this man leaving high society, England, and giving his life for Jesus. Oh, Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom, the hiding place. A very well-to-do Holland family. Instead, what do they do? They hide Jews in their home. And it costs them their lives. Everyone died but her. As they were into Auschwitz camps. And then, of course, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The incredible pastor during the Nazi realm. Who preached out against Hitler. To the point that it cost him his life as well. These are the stories that I was reared in, little biographies that I was handed to to read. And family, I'm going to tell you something, because most of you have been around, you know, I personally have been in many a death beckoning circumstance. There is no natural reason I should be standing here in front of you today. None whatsoever. And in those circumstances, family, I can testify to you that he was there. He was there. How'd you like to be 11 o'clock at night, flying by yourself on a half full plane, a 727, and the captain comes on board and says, hi, this is your captain. Uh, we have a problem. Of our three engines, two are not working. And we can fly on one jet, but we can't land on one jet because we use the jets to stop the plane. So we're gonna take another hour and fly out to Tennessee where they got the longest runway in the country. And we're gonna give it a shot. <laughs> now I'm standing in front of you. As a kid raised in the stories of God being with these men and women in their hour, he first heard the news and it was, you know, two of our engines have gone out. We're having mechanic, we can't da 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 da. And there was this immediate, just like, and then it was just like, a, and then it was like, a, and the whole rest of the flight, I'm looking out the window. <laughs> Everyone around me crying, wailing. Ah! I look right across to me. It was the three threes. And right across me was this older couple. They were both probably in their late 80s. And they're just holding hands. With, they were just happy to be together. <laughs> If we're going to die, we're going to die together. And everyone else has got their head between their knees except this couple and me that's going, check it out. All the foam, all the nets, all the fire trucks. This is cool. That's not natural, but that's Jesus. And folks, I could go for hours on things that I have gone through. Surgeries, and when they're about to do major surgeries on me, back and everything else, where they normally have to come give you a sedative because people are so freaking that they know they could die, they could be paralyzed, and they walk into my office, and they, into my room, and they look at me and they go, hey, did you already give them the sedative? No, I didn't give them the sedative. They're looking at me like, are you sure? And like, well, no, I have it written down. My favorite words ever, no sedative necessary. <laughs> no sedative necessary. Because if I live, I win. If I die, I win. My dad's got this. My dad is God. He's large and in charge. And so when it comes to what the world looks like in the last days, and whether there's food, and whether there's this, and whether there's that, and whoever's in government, and whoever's in power, and all the things that be, no sedative necessary. Amen? You see, family, this did not just come this confidence that I've had, this security, having surgeries even during COVID where people didn't even want to go in the hospital. And I was like, great, the line went down. Let me get in. <laughs> Why? 
How? It didn't just come, folks. A foundation in my life was laid as well from my mom, my dad, from my family, my extended family, from my church family, from Christianity as a whole as I would go to camps and meet other kids and teenagers and hear speakers. You see, folks, my life turned out very different. You know why? Because I had a very different kind of drug problem than most of my friends. My drug problem was this. I was drugged to church on Sunday mornings. I was drugged to church on Sunday nights, Wednesday nights and the Thursday night youth groups. I was drugged to church for weddings and funerals and baptisms and potlucks. I was drugged to family reunions and community socials no matter the weather. I was drugged by my ears when I was disrespectful to adults. I was also drugged to the woodshed when I disobeyed my parents, told a lie, brought home a bad report card, did not speak with respect, spoke ill of the teacher or the preacher, because it was my dad, or if I didn't put forth my best effort in everything that was asked of me. I was drugged to the kitchen sink to have my mouth washed out with soap. If I uttered profanity, I was drugged out to pull weeds with my mom in the garden, flowers beds in the cooklers and the ragweeds and the thistles along with all of the other things in dad's field. I was drugged to the homes of families, friends and neighbors to help out some poor soul who had no one to mow the yard, repair the clotheslines or chop some wood. And my mother had known that I ever took a single dime for any of this kindness she would have drugged me back to the woodshed. <laughs> Those drugs are still in my veins and they affect my behavior in everything I do, say, or think. They are stronger than alcohol, cocaine, crack, heroin, or pot. And if today's children had this kind of drug problem, I believe America would be a different place. You see, folks, what I'm talking about is not churchianity. I'm talking about what lived out Christianity looks like. I'm here and I am testifying. My faith today is not in government. It's not in injections. It's not in anything other than Jesus Christ and that he died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day again according to the scriptures. Why does he repeat it twice? Because he says, folks, he is trustworthy. I mean, talk about integrity. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. According to the scriptures, I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and that he loves us. And then if we will put our faith and trust in him, we will not perish but have everlasting life. See, the thing is, church, we talk a lot today about secondhand smoke. We get all these laws and all of these things all over the place because we're so concerned about secondhand smoke. You know what I had? I had a lot of secondhand learning. See, because being around parents who loved the Lord a mom who would tell me stories about Jesus, about the people in the Bible. Being around an environment, my secondhand learning was things like hymns. Trust me, six, seven, eight, nine year old kid isn't going, hmm, can I memorize this song? Could you imagine being a blonde, blue eyed kid in Papakalea? 40 pounds wet, <laughs> being called a blankety blank all day long, but inside, having in my head as I walk to school, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within that veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, in him my righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Why? On Christ the solid rock I stand. 
All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. If you don't think what you're playing on the radio right now has eternal impact, think again. Pay attention to what's being played in front of your children, stated. Because as we see very potentially the world taking some hard shifts very quickly towards what it really means to stand for Jesus, to live for Jesus, to be persecuted as a Christian. To whom have we pointed our children? See, as moms, I know you want to prepare your kids as well as you can for the things that are to come upon their life in this world. But please, do not forget or neglect to prepare them for the next world as well. Because that one lasts a whole lot longer. And it doesn't matter what scholarship they got. It doesn't matter what college they got into. What matters is, can they say, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus, blood, and righteousness. Amen. Amen. Be filled up. Family, let's be ready to pour out Jesus when we are squeezed. Amen. Amen. Sounds like someone's alarm just went off to say, you're done, pastor. (laughs) Amen. So before I close, what I encourage you is is as we look through the gospel of Mark, he's taking us to the cross. But before we get to the cross, Jesus prepared his people for what was to come. I'm trying to do the same thing as an under shepherd under my king. This is that as we know the cross, but are we prepared? Are we understanding that he will bring us through? He has a plan to guide and provide, to direct and protect, that God's ways are not our ways, that he is large and in charge, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is what is offered to you today. Do you have that Christianity or do you have some form of churchianity, some kind of assurance because you did something in ninth grade and you memorized something and went forward and had a baptism and a couple of pictures with someone that you believe that you are eternal bound? Well, let someone be brass enough to say that unless we look, live, sound, think, and act like Jesus... There is question because he says what his disciples look like. Not me, not a church, but God's word, God's will, and God's way. And his children know his peace. For some of you today, that's going to mean maybe coming on up. I don't know if you've ever just tried to get on your knees before at a prayer bench and pray. If you haven't, try it. Fall somewhere else, just try it. There's something about just coming in awe before your God, lover, savior, maker, friend. It's called Christianity, not churchianity. Aloha, my name is Jason, and I'm the media director here at One Love. And I want to say thank you today for tuning in. We hope you were inspired and strengthened with today's celebration. If you are new to One Love, we want to encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things that are happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more about the studies throughout the Bible. There are many ways to stay united during this time of separation, and we encourage you to take the first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube and you want to stay more informed about the new content on this channel, hit the subscribe button below. Most importantly, if you've made that decision to follow Christ today, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at office at onelove.org or call us at 808-955-9335 and let us pray with you. Our ministry leaders are ready to serve you. One last thing. If you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, check out goodnewshawaii.com. 
There you'll find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship booklet designed to encourage your new faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love today. We hope you were blessed by our time together. Aloha. Aloha.